Welcome to Third Side. I'm John Shaw. And I'm Jared McGee. This episode, we are joined by our guest priestess Shannon Gostin. Where we will be talking about sexuality in a repressed society. Welcome, Shannon. Hi. How you doing? <laughs> so far, so good, I guess. Awesome. Look, so, sexuality in a repressed society. Let's jump right into it. We see signs of sexual repression all throughout society. What stands out to you know mo- the most to you? Uh, well, we're going through kind of like a, I don't even know how to explain it, like a, a wave of conservatism. And I'm not quite sure if it's just because conservatives are getting a little bit more ballsy or just, you know, the culture is changing. But we've literally gone from sort of like the flower power open generation in the 80s, which was open in the 90s, all of a sudden into, you know, what we have now, yeah. um, which is both frightening and strange. Um, but you know, as it stands, it's, it's becoming a little bit more repressed and I'm not a fan of that. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, what about in, you know, on a more microcosmic level, like in your town, like what do you see in your daily lives? Hmm. Hmm. Not a lot of, of, of being open per se. I mean, I do a lot of my socializing on Facebook because I don't like people, <laughs> That's what we but you know, yeah. I, I, I'm typically a person that doesn't hide what I do or what I like. I'm very open. Um, part of me just does not care. So I feel like if I can, you know, inspire somebody else to kind of like open the book a little or be more honest with what they like, you know, that works for me. And um, I do find that I get very mixed reactions to this when I actually discuss it with people who aren't as open, per se, like not our people, um, especially in terms of like enjoying pornography or – um, you know, I'm in a non-monogamous relationship, so it's kind of like, you know, I'll discuss, like, helping my husband, like, hit on a girl, and people will just be like, what? You do that? You're not worried about him leaving you? You know, and it's just like, well, you know, the cheating's taking out of it, like, why, why, you know, why would I care? There's certain things that I don't particularly enjoy that he does, and there's things that he doesn't particularly enjoy that I do, so it's kind mm-hmm. of... You know, and a lot of people don't understand that, and it's kind of out of their realm of, um, you know, experience or, or um, anything that they would even try, even though I would hazard a guess that most people at least fantasize about it a few times. Hmm. I think you definitely see repression in that in a lot of people because you almost have to teach yourself not to look. You know, you yep. can't just look at someone and be like, hey, that person looks good, you know, or hey, check that one out. Hmm. And then when you take when you take something as, as traumatic as being cheated on and turn it in, into like an aphrodisiac, I think that uh, strengthens your relationship in, in many ways. Not, not saying it's for everybody, no. but it's, uh, it's, it's definitely interesting to see that flip, that flip side of the, uh, the coin. Yeah, it definitely takes away a lot of that because that's usually everybody's greatest fear. You know, and once that's gone, it sort of like takes a lot of stress. And <laughs> What's that? <laughs> <laughs> My docs are going crazy. They're conservatives. Yeah. They don't agree. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. They don't approve. No. <laughs> so, um, yeah. <laughs> that's awesome. So, how about, do you see a difference in, in the sexual repression of, you know, in, in the United States, uh, you know, different from other countries? Is there a big um, difference? It is kind of different. I mean, I, I dated somebody briefly from another country where um, prostitution was legal. And he told me, you know, oh, this is probably this was a long time ago, over a decade ago. And, you know, we were talking about our, our sexual past. You know, he said, well, you know, I slept with a prostitute a few times. And at first I'm like, oh, my God. But then I'm just saying to myself, why is that bad? Um, it's really not. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I don't I don't see what's wrong with either a man or a woman selling sex for money. I mean, it's essentially the same thing as pornography is. Yeah. Um, yeah. Except it's in so, 3D. Yeah. <laughs> so and then, I mean, what's the dinner and exchanging it for dinner in a movie? You know, that's yeah. for many guys. That's their end game anyway. They're only if they could skip dinner in a movie, many of them would. Yeah. So I what's the difference? And now between it's called going Netflix and it? chill. So yeah, yeah. yeah. But, and it, third it, side and chill. Yeah. That was kind <laughs> of like my first introduction to um, realizing that that you know things are different and and the things that I sort of culturally had absorbed thinking was wrong. Um, are actually not, um, especially in terms of things like that. It's consenting adults exchanging yeah. two things, you know. And that you see on the, you know, in, in 
other countries, uh, like on the news, they have like nude women sometimes. Their commercials are very sexually explicit, or what people mm-hmm. would consider here to, to be sexually explicit. But here they don't do that. They won't allow that and all that stuff. So that's a good sign of the, the repression that we're talking about. Oh, Why do you think that is, though? <clears throat> Uh, it's really strange because on one hand you can't see like blatant nudity but you can really hint at it and you can have horrible you know violent sort of non pornographic you know sex scenes and stuff like that but you know god forbid you show boobs or you know an ass (laughs) it's just it's ridiculous um you know god you know you say the f word that's terrible you know but can't show you know things that we all have yeah which is a little insane to me it's, it stems from you know being taught to be ashamed of natural instincts and that oh, yeah. seems to be what it boils down to and then once you get herd mentality all gathering together to agree that this is so bad to do and then all of a sudden they're all thinking about it i mean sex toys are being sold all the time your amazon guys bringing them to you all the time do you think that the people who are buying these sex toys, um, do you feel that it enhances relationships or are these people ashamed of wanting to buy these things or what are your thoughts on that? I, I definitely think there's still a shame involved, especially for women, um, especially since you see a lot of it, you know, even though it's marketed toward women, um, you see more, you know, men being a lot more comfortable with it. Um, and as far as, you know, for me, it's kind of like, it, these things do actually enhance every once in a while. Um, there are some men that I've come across in my life who would rather use those than actually, like, you know, um, do penetrative sex. I'm not quite sure why. Um, some of them have a detachment thing. You know, like, mm. they just... Well, I mean, like, they're detached from, like, having sex. They'd much rather, like, watch themselves doing things to you than actually be in the act, um, which I haven't quite... Sort of voyeuristic. Yeah, <laughs> in that sense. Um you know, and they're all, they're very, they're shaped differently. There's a billion different kinds. So one might not work for you per se, especially for women. I mean, there's a gazillion different times, but um, sometimes you have to kind of figure out what works best for you. And when you're alone, I mean, that's a, that's an enhancer. And, you know, unlike men, we don't have that long retraction period. So (laughs) (laughs) it's like, we can get, you know, I can get off multiple times during the day. So it's kind of like, you know, it's there. Get okay. off in the morning, in the evening, have to see their significant other. You get, you brought up something really uh, interesting. I remember um, as a kid, like my, you know, my mother is Catholic and all that. So like anything that would come on a TV that was like nudity or you know her girl's shirts off or these guys are kissing too too deeply, um, you know, turn your head, don't look, don't look. And it's yep. so. Do you think that that sort of thing done by parents actually makes voyeurism more interesting or more? I guess, uh, you know, you know what I mean, yeah. right? <laughs> I mean, I, I definitely know from my experience, you know, like that stuff was hidden. Like my father was not allowed to have pornography in the house, you know, like we can't, we couldn't watch racy shows, you know, we was, I wasn't even allowed to watch MTV, which was really sad, Oh, but yeah. Back when it played music. <laughs> That's why it was good. Yeah. Yeah. So it was, it was one of those things where, you know, my, my mother was at least so worried about that, that when I actually came across pornography, it was like, whoa, what is this shit? Cause it was the typical, like you go out in the woods with your friends and you lift up a log or whatever. And there's, oh, there's, what are these magazines hidden here? It's you know, that so, actually happened to me. Yeah, no, yeah, I, me, well, too. That's, me too. That's really how it happened. It's always under a log. Like, oh. <laughs> so many of my friends have had the same experience. And it went from being something that was never discussed, never explained, to, um, oh my God, here it is, here's all the mechanics um, and all the parts in this magazine. And of course, when your parents are telling you, oh, look at that, that's that's bad, that's wrong, you can't just go up to them and say, mom and dad, what's this? Right. So in one sense, you're getting a lot of your sexual information and sexual development from porn magazines and maybe someone's older sibling or, you know, someone who's older than you who might not even really be much more experienced than you are. Mm. So, you know, a lot of that came from, you know, a lot of my friends were male, and a lot of my friends also had older brothers. I mean, when I was in, I want to say, like, third, fourth grade, I was actually dealing pornography. (laughs) We would steal magazines from, you know, my friend's older brothers and dad, Mm. and I would go hawk them at school. (laughs) Nice. And, yeah, so, I mean, it... 
these things have always kind of been around me and been around my life. And I, I do think it's very damaging to um, try to explain these things away as abnormal or something you shouldn't engage in. And, you know, as far as my son was concerned, um, I explained it to him on a level he could understand for his age um, and just told him what certain things were appropriate in public and what weren't. And, you know, he... Um, you know, he, he feels like he can actually come to us, yeah. which was really good. And when he turned 15, um, we bought a couple boxes of condoms. We hit him in the house and just said, like, this is where they are. And if you need yeah. more, Easy. well, my husband said this. I stayed out of it because, you know, I don't want to embarrass him. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Mom! <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, you know, it was... It, we, you know, you can't live in the, you can't live in this world where, you know, I mean, I was having sex at 15, so you can't pretend that it's not going to happen. And if you sit there and tell them, well, don't do it, well, what are they going to do? They're going to go right to doing it. Yeah. Um, so I think, you know, a big thing in having kids is being responsible enough to understand that it is going to happen and you're not going to be able to stop it. And it's better that they be educated and have what they need at hand than for you to be prudish. <laughs> yeah, see, one of the things, like, you could take, you could take uh, like, swearing for a thing. People call it cursing, whatever. Um, when I've seen my friends grow up and they were in households where it didn't allow them to swear, and when they finally hung out with us alone with no one adult, no adults around, they sounded like idiots because they didn't know how to do it. Fucking, yep. that's fucking great. <laughs> that is fucking great. Let's fucking do that. And it's like, wait a minute, dude. <laughs> because in my house... You know, my, my my mother I wasn't, but my dad didn't care. And when I went out there and did it, I didn't sound like a, a jackass, you know. And so I decided that, you know, my kids can express themselves how they want in, them, in their house. And when they go out, they, they told me that. They, they're like, my friend swears. They're like, I don't really feel the need to, you know. So that same analogy can apply toward sexual repression. When the parents are like, hey, uh, don't look at that. Don't look at this. It's naughty. The kids yeah. go out and they become like lunatics with sex so to speak. Yeah. you know and I, you know yeah. crazy you know, they're either afraid of it or they become dangerously obsessed right you right. know you look at people that might have you know deviant or abhorrent sexual behavior that's where a lot of that comes from is that it's dirty it's wrong don't masturbate that's evil you know just, just things like that that are absolutely just especially in this day and age just yeah. wrong yeah yeah that's pretty much i mean that applies to everything else. Knives, guns, whatever you want to, yep. you know, pick your poison. The yep. earlier you teach someone about it, the more the more desensitized in a good way they become. Because while their yep. friends are out there finally discovering it, it's old news to them. Yeah, and it's definitely like a maturity thing, um, especially where they're calmer about it and know more about it and can come to an adult for it, which is what we're here for. We're not here to repress them. We're here to say this is how you do it properly so nothing bad comes of it. Yeah. You know, and... It especially too, um, you know, parents sometimes push the whole, you know, what's you it has to be with somebody you love. You mm. want to save it for somebody who you're gonna be with. No, I mean, <laughs> how yeah. many of us have had sex with people that we just later did not care for? Or was just a one-time thing, or never friends with Bennies? You know what I mean? Never. I would <laughs> no, never. No, we're all good. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, that's a very unrealistic pressure to put on people too. Yeah. Um, you know, the idea you have to love somebody to have sex with them. So, you, like with porno and stuff out there, you see these porns out there where the mom is teaching the daughter how to perform fellatio on her boyfriend. How come you never see that in real life? <laughs> <laughs> and where can we find... No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I never ran into that. I don't know. I don't watch those. I'm an amateur fan. I like the amateur stuff. <laughs> awesome. How does one's own body image relate to sexuality in a repressed society? Well, there's an idea that certain types of people can't, won't, shouldn't have sex, um, especially in regards to a lot of the friends I have that are disabled. Yeah. Um, some people assume that disabled people don't want sex, that they can't have sex, um, which is absolutely not true. Um, and you look, especially at, especially at women, I mean, men have the same problems and the same anxieties, it's just not out there as much. Um, you know, body shape, you know, or is my stomach too big? Is my ass too small? <laughs> you know, <Yeah. laughs> just, you know, and everybody has, everybody has that. And I think being in the church of Satan actually is, is a big, you know, it's a big ego booster because there are men that are very openly into everything. Um, you know, when I first joined, I was well aware that Coop was a member and he was doing those giant, you know, um, 
just like, you know, the big double ladies. And I'm just thinking like, wow, you know, this is kind of amazing. And that's sort of another thing that attracted me to the church because I was thinking, you know, this guy's painting these big girls all naked and, you know, they're very sexual, very sensual. And, and that's cool because that's accepted. Um, and then when I joined, cause I was much bigger than I am now. Um, when I joined me too, and it was, <laughs> <laughs> And it was really cool to get, you know, the attention from men who genuinely like bigger women, yeah. which was something that I hadn't really come across. And it wasn't necessarily because men didn't like bigger women. It was because they felt afraid to actually say that they did hmm. or actually, you know, that that's been actually kind of a theme of my earlier dating life would be, you know, after I would get with someone, men would show up and say, oh, hey, you know, I would have dated you before. And it just never happened. And I'm thinking like, really? Because you never showed any interest. Yeah. And, you know, it, it, when you, um, cause I'm on a uh, fat life, which is basically like a, uh, Facebook for fetishes. Um, and when you take away like the commercial and the, uh, you know, what society tells you you want and you look at what people around you on that, you know, on that site are looking at, hmm. there really is a place for everybody. Yeah. You know, it doesn't matter if you're fat, if you're thin, if your boobs are huge, if your dick is small, um, if you're disabled, you're missing limbs, you're in a wheelchair. There is a fetish for everything, and there is somebody who is going to find you attractive. So they have a, they have a group for men with, with small penises? And what, what's, what's the name of that one? <laughs> <laughs> there really is. There's um there's a fetish for that. And, and typically men with smaller members tend to be good in other places you know so there's there's some women who and men who really kind of dig that more than the sexual penile penetration i guess you could say <laughs> so there's a place for everything and yeah. it's it's very it's, it's cool to see and it's very freeing as much as some of the fetishes might not be um something i would ever be into <laughs> it's mm. it's it's cool to see it's cool to see people yeah. feeling they can exercise that um so you know despite the conservatism there is a healthy uh world of fetish out there yeah um this brings me to to standards i think we can really talk about double standards a lot here um because you see like movies and tv and all these different things women are uh you know degraded for having multiple sex partners where men are like oh he's my hero you know yep. and and things like that even even like uh shirtless things with men and women can't have their shirts off i mean do you think yeah, that, i mean is that is that becoming you know better or is it still just the same or worse than it was? What what are your thoughts on that? The problem I'm seeing is that it's in a sense it's becoming better because women are getting sick of it. Um, men are also kind of getting sick of you know the fact that it portrays them as something with that that they're not. Yeah. Um, but. <clears throat> As I say that, there are also people who complain, oh, well, feminist this and feminist that, and it, we have equality, I don't know what you're bitching about. And the reality is we don't. Yeah. Um, you know, I don't understand how a man that has tits as big as mine can walk around with his shirt off, and I can't. Yeah. Um, you know, it, I think it comes down to a lot of the, uh, you know, the Judeo-Christian concepts of women should be chased and covered and, you know, all this other nonsense. Um mm. You know, and then they're not valuable if they're not virgins <clears throat> to be sold as cattle. You know, it's just it's 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 stupid little things like that that the culture has clung to, which, you know, especially as Satanists, we should be aware of. And um, I consider sex as more of like, you know, you wouldn't hire a plumber necessarily who just got out of plumbing school and had never had any real practice, would you? I mean, the same thing should be a sex partner. I wouldn't want a virgin. <clears throat> Actually, I've had sex with a virgin. It's really not fun. Yeah, um, <laughs> it's terrible. Am I doing it right? It's like, oh, yeah, no, go. I it's. Go. I will never do that again as long as I live. It's not fun. It's <clears throat> terrible. It's. It's. Yeah, I mean, it's that's funny. stuff you really should learn when you're a young adult. <laughs> <laughs> And speaking of society and the double standards and uh, the, the typical roles that society feels we should play, there's there's all the time you hear stories about these powerful men, these CEOs who are into a more submissive lifestyle. Mm. They they don't want to be the dominant type. Um, what are your thoughts on that? I've found that pretty often to be true. Um, you know, I, I, especially in regards to people who have very stressful, kind of traumatic jobs, um, police officers especially. Mm, <laughs> um, and, and as somebody who is like very much dominant in life and always kind of in control and stuff, I, I enjoy the same thing. I like totally giving up in, bed, in the bedroom. Um, so I definitely understand where that's a thing. Shut up, John. All right. <laughs> um, 
you know, and it, 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 <laughs> you know, and it, in a sense too. I mean, there's there's a double standard for uh, men in that where <laughs> squeaky toy, where um, you know, men are not allowed to be cuckolded because that's a dirty word now, or men are not allowed to be submissive because that's not masculine, regardless of how they are in life. So it's something that for a lot of men is very hidden, which is very unfortunate. Yeah. Um, you know, there's also the stigma, like you know, of hot wifing, where you have someone else have sex with your significant other while you're either watching or getting photo or video. Um, all these things are are sort of taboo for men because they're considered, you know, being being weak or you know sharing or just, which is ridiculous because so many men actually are into all of these things, um, surprisingly large numbers of them, um, and again like the double standards don't just hurt women they hurt men yeah. and the culture unfortunately is such where you know so many of them are afraid of actually dropping the facade and getting what they want and to the point that is that it can cause a lot of relationship issues because yeah. um, i know from myself that trying to play a role that i'm not really into is very hard um but I, I do find that the people that live the high-powered life or the stressful life do like to let go in that aspect of their lives. Interesting. You mentioned earlier about a man you know, being in public with larger breasts than you have. Um, that, that made me think of breastfeeding. Like, Why do you think breastfeeding is still taboo today? Again, it's the, the whole Judeo-Christian thing where, you know, Anything feminized has to be hidden, and God forbid a men find that part of you attractive that you can't use them for what they were, you know, meant for. Yeah. Um, it's another double standard which unfortunately hurts mothers. I mean, that's why we have breasts to feed babies, not to entice men and well, women too. Um, why do men have breasts? The, I think probably because we all start out female. Yeah, that's what I heard. <laughs> <laughs> Well, when do you think uh, children start really becoming embarrassed by nudity? To be honest, I think it probably starts around the time their parents start saying, you got to cover up. Um, on one hand, it's probably a good thing where they start learning modesty. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, on the other hand, too, it's like you got to come at it from the right way. You know, instead of saying, oh, you got to hide that. That's dirty. Um, you got to come at it and just say kind of like, all right, well, you're getting older. You're a bigger boy, bigger girl. It's time to start wearing pants. You know, I mean, I, I was very much a nudist as a child, and I remember, I remember actually arguing like, you know, why do I have to put my shirt on when all the boys are out there with their shirt off? Sex is taboo to a point where medical conditions that involve sexual organs are even taboo to discuss publicly. Uh, I know from personal experience that when someone has some sort of an operation that involves a no-no area, you can't even come out and discuss the ramifications of these operations and the type of impact it has in your real life. But it's something that's important to these people, and there's this there's feeling that you just can't come out and speak about it publicly. Have you run into anything like that, or are you familiar with it? A lot of, you know, as far as getting surgery and stuff like that, for women, a lot of it in between other women, we're very open about it. Like, we'll talk about hysterectomies or, you know, I'm very open with other women about being sterilized because um, I know they think about that very often, some of them. And, uh, you know, we, we talk about conditions in our bodies. I know men are very much not, at least as far as I've seen, into talking so much about their things. And, and there's a stigma, too, around having a vasectomy, which is shocking to me. Because it's not even about, you know, it, part of it's, you know, even if you don't want any more kids and you're taking precautions and maybe you're, you know, the person that you're with is already sterile, still, you know, it's it's one of those things where it's like, I have to be fertile. Why? <laughs> <laughs> I don't understand that. I don't understand, you know, these, these little male quirks. But there are plenty of men that feel less than masculine because they don't have viable sperm shooting through there, which is just strange. <laughs> that did not happen to me. I was never ashamed about my vasectomy. <laughs> I'll tell you all about it. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, there's, there's definitely a lot of, you know, people can't even say the word vagina sometimes, which is surprising. I mean, they are funny sounding words, but, you know, it, and it is good to talk about this stuff. And, and I would. <laughs> I was waiting for it. <laughs> I had to. Right? I was waiting for it. I had to. Yeah. You know, and it, it, it's important, too, as far as sexual health. I mean, we have such a stigma around STDs. Um, you know, that's why AIDS was 
able to spread. People were afraid. You know, there was a lot of misinformation about it. It was considered a gay disease. Yeah. Uh, you know, Great. so it was gay related immunodeficiency. Yeah. yeah. So it's it's very God hates fags. Yep. And so there's a lot of a lot of uh, stigma around it, especially you know even for ones that are very um, you know manageable or curable, um, which is also a shame because that's something that people really should be more open about and feel free to be open about. Because even if you have a disease that you cannot get rid of, there are other people out there with that same disease that you could find, you know, and be happy with. And not talking about it or stigmatizing it is a bad thing. Yeah, I want to talk about the porn industry. I, I, in fact, I, I have to talk about the porn industry um, because I'm really interested in, in your in your take on this. Because uh, women's consumption of pornography it's really under the radar, and Pornhub reported that it went down 22 percent during the women's marches. So women Which are women shocking. are using yeah, <laughs> women <laughs> well, are using it. Yeah. I mean, when you consider, yes, there was a large number of women that went to that march, but consider the large number of women who were not at that march, who were probably also watching pornography. I mean, I would assume that we're at least 50% of all pornography consumption. Mm. And it is geared specifically always toward men. And, um, you know, the problem with that is not only that we don't get pornography that kind of gels with us. Um, the problem too is there's a very large lack of real, realistic lesbian porn. Um, it's if you see and like I've looked. you know, <laughs> well you know it's, it's these it's it's the videos you know where you see these two girls and they have like ten inch long fingernails. No, because that's going to tear you up inside. Yeah, <laughs> that's that's something you learn very quickly. Those are not lesbian fingernails. Yeah, um, you know, you see. You see different types of lesbian who are very underrepresented, like Butch. Um, I'm a big fan of the lipstick lesbians. You know, they look like boys, still kind of wear makeup. You know, you never find that kind of pornography out there. Mm -hmm. And the way that the women pleasure each other is a man's idea of what lesbians do, not what actually happens. Ah, like that scissoring thing. I mean, that's just a waste of energy. Like what you want to burn actually off happens. <laughs> 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 definitely not the scissoring thing I mean some people I'm sure do it but it's more like a workout than it is actually like getting off <laughs> you know what I mean like if you want to burn some calories but it, it, it's it, the pornography out there is very you know women are very underrepresented um, yeah. and you know that's that's why you see such an increase in the amateur stuff you know a lot of these websites have nothing but amateur stuff on it or amateur mm. looking yeah. Because the you know the the shaved clean Hollywood scripted stuff is not as appealing as seeing real people doing real things, yeah. um, especially for women. You know, you see a and, lot of uh, the point of view stuff from a man's point of view. You never see it yeah. from the women. Yeah. The woman, you know, it's uh, that's really interesting. <laughs> and I know at the office when our copy machine broke, the way to fix it was not have sex with the guy that came out to do it. Didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> never does. <laughs> but it, yeah it's it's it it is kind of sad because i love pornography and i'm very open about that and my favorite things are the are the videos that you know a couple shoots in their bedroom um not something that has a script or a storyline or has perfectly shaved people or you know that just to me is is nasty and you know you can tell when people are actually having sex and enjoying themselves and if they're doing okay stop take all right get the fluffer Yep. You know, more saliva. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Exactly. Here's the fake cum shot. You know, you, you know the difference. Yeah. And, and unless you actually have a specific fetish for the Hollywood porn, eventually it stops being interesting. Yeah. yeah. And with all those behind the scenes type porn things, where you actually see them set up those fake cum shots, like have you ever seen one of those? They, yeah, they, sure, it's a, it's a thing that they actually make. This, you know, they, they did the whole, you know, okay, pause. The cameras are still rolling, and this, this lady came out with a bowl. And like started, you know, decorating her for it. And then the guy, they got in a position, he just made the oh noise and then they just recorded it. But the whole thing was fake. Like it was it looked like it was on a Cinnabon. <laughs> <laughs> um, Enjoy hungry. that next time you have a Cinnabon. Yeah. Crazy. I will. <laughs> I've got <laughs> better now, huh? <laughs> awesome. So what's your favorite type of uh, porn movies to watch? I know you said the amateur stuff, but like specific scenes or specific um, actors actresses like i don't have anybody specific i like to watch mm -hmm. um 
and I don't really have like body type or anything like that. I'm more of like function. Um, I'm a big fan of listening to men make noise, and I'm a huge fan of cream pie, as I gotta tell you. So I'll watch wow. anything. <laughs> yeah, I typically when I'm getting off, it's quick. So I'll fast forward to like a few minutes before the action happens, and then dive you know, right in. Yeah, I'm not a story person. I'm not a build up for ten minutes kind of person. I'm like, yeah, I got five minutes. I gotta Let's rub do one it. out. Yeah, totally. Yeah, that's funny. Yep, start my day. <clears throat> but yeah, I'm a big fan of that. I like um very um I like the violent stuff too. That's fun. Um, which there's another taboo against that. Um, lots of women have um, rape fantasies or you know being taken without consent fantasies, and that's a taboo because not only are we, you know especially other women would say oh well you promote that stuff and um, you're trying to say that it's okay, mm. but men also get this idea that oh it's what re- women really want and no I mean it's it's a fantasy it's part of, you know it's the same thing as you know people dressing up as Peter Pan and wanting to have sex with the pirates and shit you know I've actually Arr. seen that. Yeah, totally. it's really bad. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Have you seen the Serbian film? No, not yet. Oh man, you had to mention that. <laughs> John, have you seen it? No, I, you've explained it enough for me to realize that I, I don't need to see it. <laughs> yeah, not twice. Trust me. But yes. yeah, if that's uh, if that's a genre you're into, you won't be able to unsee it though. Mm. <laughs> Look at John's face. It's good. <laughs> I, I watched the preview for it. I'm like, oh, I don't know. Yeah, I, I might give it a. I mean, my favorite movie is is um is Happiness by Todd Salons, and I can tell you guys haven't seen it because you're making that what expression. What is it? <laughs> <laughs> Philip Seymour Hoffman's in it. Oh, but it, it's it's the live one or um yeah, it's not great. He was alive. Yeah. <laughs> but um yeah, he, it's it's a disturbing movie to say the least. But it's one of those ones that kind of gets. It makes you want to take a shower after. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it, it, it's not so much like the sex involved. It's just that it's very real. Oh, <laughs> it's wow. It's very real. Um, but, yeah, I mean, it, I'm not opposed to fucked up movies. But um, to get back to the point, um, yeah, and, um, you know, I do like the violent stuff. I'm typically one that likes to have a good wrestle beforehand. Love getting choked out till I pass out. That's fun. But um, that's yeah. a taboo. Say yeah. that one more time. <laughs> <laughs> it's a taboo. You know, it's wrong for, you know, and it's wrong for men to, you know, society-wise, it's wrong for men to want to do that to somebody. Yeah. Um, so, you know, a lot of men go unfulfilled thinking that these things that they want to do or would like to do um, are wrong or mean that there's something wrong with them. And that's not true. Because um, mm-hmm. there are men that want to get choked out. So... You know, it, it's that has never even crossed my mind. I didn't, yeah, I didn't even know that. that. Mm. Oh, they're, and they get their balls stomped on and you know pegged and yeah, it's good stuff. It's it's not. <laughs> I've that seen I'm that. I've seen that idea. stuff like ru- like ruined <laughs> orgasms like, and stuff. I'm like, why, dude? Why? I don't. I'm not saying it's wrong to do that. Do whatever you. But just the thought of it is just like, oh my god, I can't even imagine the. Um, no, you, gotta, you know just what? Be, that's just it, be guys. gentle. I'll just be gentle. <laughs> Oh, that's bad. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, there's there's definitely fetishes that don't gel with everybody. I I can't get behind the furry thing or the adult baby thing, but um, <laughs> these are all things that involve consenting adults. You know, people that live and breathe in our society, and these are things that we we should be accepting of. Yeah. Um, you know. Speaking of uh, being accepting, um, and while we're talking about fetishes, you've mentioned polyamorous relationships. Oh, Do you yeah. consider that to be a, more of a lifestyle, or is it a fetish, or a little bit of both? Um, I think it encompasses a lot of things, and there's a, there's definitely a difference between like non-monogamous and polyamorous, because yeah. um, non-monogamous is more like you want to have sex with other people, maybe your friends, um, couple swap, that kind of thing. Um, polyamorous is you actually want to have like a loving relationship with someone which could be on par or similar to like the person you're married to or the main person that you're with so there's definitely a difference hi this is magister robert johnson i'm the author of the satanic warlock a book you probably heard quite a bit about We've had unprecedented success with this book, and warlocks throughout the world are clamoring for more and more information. The book is just the beginning. 
The book is just the jumping off point, a primer, so to speak, for warlocks all over the world to gain knowledge, magical knowledge, satanic knowledge. The Satanic Warlock website, which will premiere probably within the next couple of months, is going to offer the next level of information. We will expand and upon all areas, including power and seduction, and just what it means to be a man in this post-politically correct era that we're, we're now living in. This book was just the beginning. So jump on over to the satanicwarlock.com, sign up for the new information and to be one of the first to join the website. You won't be disappointed. Both of those relationships, you know, society-wise, are again they're taboo. Like, why would, how could you ever love more people, you know, more than one person, yeah. or, um, you know, how do you figure this out or that out? Or, um, and it's it's not as complicated as you would think it is. It's definitely there's definitely emotions involved. Um, there's definitely jealousy involved. Um, there's fear, um, that sort of thing. Because um, someone would feel well if you're having those emotions with someone else and you feel them less for me and type of things like that. Yeah. And there's, there's definitely those things. And obviously there is always the worry that the person will eventually leave you for someone else. I, that could happen though in straight relation. I mean, not, not straight up uh, normal relationships. Yeah. It um, does. It probably happens more because there isn't an allowance to go have sex with people that you are attracted to. Yeah. Um, I will say that the, the jealousy and the fear and that kind of thing actually do fade. Um, the more you're exposed to it. I definitely have had moments where I'm just like, wow, this chick has a lot in common with you that I don't have. And, you know, I sit there and I think, okay, I don't really like that. But then I'm just like, you know what? The people that I talk to have certain things in common that I don't have with my husband. So it kind of balances out. And, um, you know, it, it, it's, it's definitely something where you have to have a lot of conversations about and you have to be willing to be there always for your partner you know where if i'm not feeling like necessarily super loved i can go up to him and just say i need some attention i'm, I'm having these feelings and i get that attention and then i'm fine um you know and we also have a deal where it's sort of like we're very open with what's going on so if i'm online and i'm talking to somebody that you know i want to have sex with the, or have had and he kind of contacts me I'll say well I'm talking to this person but I'll tell them to hold on while I talk to you um, so you have to definitely have a deep respect for the person that you're with with yeah um, <clears throat> and um, it, it works it definitely yeah. works and it's odd because it has made our relationship actually m much stronger mm. um, you know our our it's it's deeper um, we're more willing to um, just sort of be very open with each other. We're calmer, um, have a lot more sex, which is interesting, <laughs> but it, it's definitely, um, it's definitely opened a lot of doors into our relationship just together, um, which has been great. You know, I'm, I'm happy about it just for that. Um, but it's also been good to get to know other people on that level and kind of, uh, open that door as well. Yeah. And, you know, there's, there's definitely in every, in, it doesn't matter if you have the best sex in the world with the person that you're with or married to. Everybody has it differently. So it's fun to kind of, you know, get out there and try it with someone else. And that was, you know, because that's actually a question I've come across. Like, oh, well, your husband doesn't do it for you? I'm like, no, he does it great. But 
there are other people out there that do different things or do it a different way. So it's just kind of like experiencing a really great thing with someone who might do it a little bit better or different. Or you get that excitement. Some- you know, oh, you get yeah. that excitement of your first date. You know, you oh, can yeah. have that. It's like having your cake and eating it too. You can actually feel that, you know, oh, I'm getting ready to go out on a date. And then there's your husband or your wife, you know, picking out your shirt for you. Yeah. And then, it's, it's uh, very <clears throat> yeah. It's and then surreal, I, I've great. known, I've known multiple people uh, who would benefit from doing something like this. I've seen, I've seen my friends who've got into, um, you know, troubles with cheating or some sort of infidelity. I'm like, look, if these two had a conversation beforehand yep. and just like agreed to ground rules, they would be so much happier right now. And, I, and again, like I, I'll always say, it's not for everybody, but you know, with some communication, if, if someone's cheating on you, there, there's a desire there. There's a need not met and you can do something to make it, to your advantage as opposed to being a weakness. Yeah, and I think culturally, I mean, that's another problem with viewing sex as something that's very hidden and very closeted and only between you and who you're with, um, is that it feels like you can't have sex with someone else without degrading the other person or degrading your relationship, or it has to be love. It can't just be, well, we're friends, let's just fuck, or hey, we just met like 20 minutes ago and you're cute, let's do it, you know what I mean? Um, it's both that it's it's kind of valued a little too much, you know. It's it's sex has to be this like great romantic spiritual thing. Well, no, it doesn't. It's fun. It feels good. It's a stress relief. You know, it doesn't have to mean anything other than that. And you know, you can become closer to a friend by doing that. You know. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Let's talk about uh, this one last uh, topic here. Um, you touched on it a little bit earlier, but there's pros and cons to uh, the possible legalization and destigmatizing uh, prostitution. You know, not only for the economy or the safety of those women and stuff like that, but um, also how the stigma relates to the lingering conservative Judeo-Christian nonsense in this yep. country. So, you any thoughts on that? I want to see it legalized. I would love to see it legalized yeah. in my lifetime. Um, Because it represents, you know, income for both men and women based on something that they feel like they want to sell. And it also stops, um, you know, basically being ableist. I mean, there are people who are um, permanently physically disabled who may never find somebody who deserve the right to have sex. Um, Same thing with elderly people. Um, Same thing with people who might be disfigured or otherwise might not be palatable, at least in their mind. I argue that there's always somebody out there for you, but, um, you know, that might have that. Everybody wants to have sex for the most part. Um, And to say that you can't have this, you can't buy this is not only cruel, but I would suggest that it kind of, you know, encourages sex crimes. You know, Um, I mean, if you can, you know, if if you're somebody who has an abnormal brain and you're going around thinking, well, women hate me and I hate them and stuff like that. I mean, if you can buy sex, chances are that mindset isn't going to be as prevalent. Um, cause you know, if you're paying for somebody to have sex with you, they're going to make you feel good. They're going to be friendly with you. Um, I have met girls who have done this. I've met guys that have done this too. Yeah. Um, and for the most part, they've said that their experiences are very positive and the people who that, you know, who they hook up with, um, are people who are basically like a friends with benefits. They'll do things like buy them things. It's a relationship, but it's not a, we're in a relationship, getting married, being together. So it's not, you know, the stigma is that it's this dark, dirty back alley, you know, which it can be, and it is sometimes, but legalized, it can be something that's very different. Yeah. Sorry, I was going to say, like out in Vegas, it's it's legal at the Bunny Ranch, and yep. uh, mm-hmm. you know, it's these women are tested and clean, and all these you know different scenarios uh, that's that's for safety and all these types of things. Um, it's working, it's working. So yeah. they should, and it's safer for the girls too because there's there's a bouncer somewhere nearby. We're not yep. about to see somebody's going to drag yep. them off into the woods. Yep. So I mean, it's if they're going to do it, doing it in that type of a scenario is physically safer on top of the uh, the cleanliness. Yeah. Yep. And it, you know, it can cut down on sex crime. It can cut down on sex trafficking. It can cut down on sex tourism. Um, mm-hmm. You know, if you can go buy a prostitute in your backyard, it's you know, you're not going to travel off to somewhere else where you you know it's legal and the person involved might not necessarily be wanting to be involved. Um, and you know, the age is checked as well. Um, and it, it just to me, it just makes sense because mm-hmm. there are plenty of people out there that would want it. And again, it's one of those things where the kind of religious culture 
keeps that from happening. And there's a lot of stigma around it. You know, it's always a dark, dirty thing. It's always dark, dirty women. You know, it's always the dregs of society doing this because you've been driven to it or you don't have enough of an education to do anything else or you're on drugs or, you know, just, just stuff like that, which is absolutely not always true. Right. And to change it would be great, um, especially for people that maybe they don't have anything else that they want to do for themselves other than this. Um you know, maybe they don't have any other education. Well, why should they not do this? <laughs> it just seems to me a skill set that's, that's underutilized um, for something that would be a benefit for a lot of people. And I think it also opens up the door for people who might be bisexual um, kind of getting into that or experimenting with it without having to get involved in a relationship or mm-hmm. um, have it's it be good, an embarrassing thing. Yeah. Because, you know, I mean, if, you're, if you've never done that with somebody, it's easier to pay for it so that, you know, you're not going to wind up ashamed or embarrassed if it doesn't go well. Um, you're paying. Right. So, you know, there are some people that I've heard of that will literally pay somebody to just hang out with them. Just talk yeah. to me. Like, I don't even want anything. Just I need somebody there. There um, was a bar in Jacksonville that they opened up. That's uh, <laughs> It's a cuddle bar. It's a place you go. It's filled with pillows and you just... You pay for someone, but you you literally just lay out this with soft music and candles, and you cuddle, and that's it. Wow. So there's there's definitely <laughs> something for everybody. But yeah, it's awesome. just things like that. You know, some people are very much you know taken out of society by for whatever reason, um, mental or physical, and it gives them the opportunity to kind of be a part of it, and you know not only maybe alleviate you know boredom and stress and loneliness but to maybe keep them from doing other things in society which aren't so good Um, you know i I think too when we have ahcs or artificial human companions um that'll be huge especially for people like that oh yeah shannon this has been a great and informative show we couldn't have thought of anyone else to talk to any better than you you you, (laughs) thank you so much for coming on yeah that was amazing i'm i really really i enjoyed that one if we had to walk away from this with a, like a moral of the story type of thing, what would it be, Jared? Um, I'd have to say that it's it's about communication, being open, and everyone, regardless, even if you choose to be monogamous and you choose to only, you know, whatever it is, just be open about it, be honest, and, and don't put anyone else down for what they're into. Yeah, talk to your kids, talk to your parents, talk to your loved ones, your partners, <laughs> you know, communication, you're good. That's right, Jared. All right, everyone, until next time. Hail Satan. Hail Satan. Hail Satan.